Well, good morning, 20th of October, 2024, in the House of God, and we are looking at Ezekiel 18, and uh, straight away into Romans 6, so let's pray, Lord, we are asking earnestly that you would speak to us this morning. We have your holy word, this marvellous book, written by God, not by man, uh, in the which we find everything we need for life and godliness. But it is you that breaks to us the bread of life. We want you to do that today. In Jesus' holy name we ask it. Amen. So reading one verse in Ezekiel 18, it's verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the title of my talk in brackets, it's the soul that sins. The soul that sins. And I'm going to look at that, I hope, with some clarity in a while. And I can remember years ago when I was young, hearing this chapter read, Ezekiel 18. And it so moved me and it gave me such relief. It, um, it shows God's absolute judgment against sin, his hatred of sin, and the terrible punishment of sinners, but with that too, his unspeakable mercy. And I was so grateful. I remember I was sitting in this church when I heard, it, heard this chapter read right through and my soul was so relieved. You know, I knew that God is God that sin is absolutely fatal, spiritually, and that there's no other remedy for it but the death of Jesus Christ, which we've just commemorated through the, uh, the um, elements of the Lord's Supper, but to know that God will forgive. And so sin, thank God, for Christ's sake, is not final and fatal if we turn to him believing in his Son. I'm going just to, to counteract what I've just read, and not counteract, but to provide a comforting, uh, different truth, but part of the same, really, in Romans. I'm in chapter 6, a very well-known verse for a gospel service, particularly in verse 23, the last verse in Romans 6. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now what a deep well is the human soul. I don't think we ever will, perhaps not in this life anyway, understand its depths. The, um, because of the fall of man, the change that happened when our first ancestor sinned, what a change. And I'm going to try and develop that a little bit. And I hope that all will really help me this morning with the thoughts I've got to give. But a soul you know, inside you. When I say me, I'm not talking about this body. It's me. And um, the feelings, the longings, the plans, the sensitivities the hatreds that can be there, the irrational dislike of things that God wants you to love. You know, because, the, because the soul of man has fallen, there's come a terrible change. And it ha the soul of man has got to be redeemed. That's the right word, redeemed. And um, before Adam fell, the things that trouble us now and potentially ruin us, would, he wouldn't even have understood what they mean. What do you mean, is there a God? Some people put that, some actually genuinely put that question, don't they? They genuinely doubt whether God exists. I don't think many really genuinely doubt it. If they do, they've got to overcome a lot of um, obvious common sense reasons to believe in God and they've got to overcome a lot of genuine science to get there into real unbelief. 
But some do have that question, don't they? Is, is there a God? I had some civilized. He made me and I meet him every day. He's here all the time. And um, can I know him? Well, of course, Adam knew him. I think it was every evening the Lord came down and communed with the, with the, with the creatures he had made in his image. Um, is God loving? Do you know, some people genuinely wonder whether God really loves them. And how the devil likes you to doubt that. And that really, the power of God's love, it just, it, it literally can't be measured. The older I get, perhaps I have to say that too often, but it's because it's a reality to me. My life is coming to an end. I've, my experience is many, many years now. And, and, but the, the, the central truth that love is everything, friends. I can speak like an angel. I can know all mysteries. I can use faith to move mountains. I can give myself up to a terrible martyr's death. But if, if without love, it is nothing. And I am nothing. And God is love. It's our verse for the month. He that dwells in love dwells in God, and God dwells in him. It's part of our, our reading for the month, the October 1st. That anybody could doubt it. So you, so you see the ruin that sin has brought to the soul. I'm talking about the soul. And um, There's a huge issue concerning our minds. The battle for the mind. I'm, you know where I'm going with this. But the battle for the mind. What do I actually think? How much has the ruin of sin corrupted the way I think? How many disordered tendencies are there in my thinking? And it's, it's incredibly important this. Because you, if you think wrongly... You'll act wrongly. You'll believe wrongly. You will prevent God from coming right to where he wants to be in your heart. It's a very, very important issue. To pick it up from the scriptures, and I'm going to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll give you the number. These pages are kind of stuck together. but 2 Corinthians 10 and uh, page 1170. I'm reading from verse 3, and this actually, I hope we can, and Lord, help us to digest this. It's very profound and of immense importance. Verse 3, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I've got no weaponry in my natural self, my natural thinking, my natural... I may mean well, I hopefully will mean well, but it's, that's nothing if I'm in the flesh. If my approach is in the flesh, my understanding is in the flesh, the way I do things is in the flesh, hopeless. We walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that is natural. What would be natural weapons? I mean, if you're on the right side, meaning to win in a cause that is right, natural weapons. Argument? Rational study, conveying sensible ideas, truthful ideas, they will do nothing without the Spirit of God. That's the key, isn't it? It's the key to everything, really. And when I pray for people, I so often find myself just falling right, but it's not a cop-out, it's not a, a removing myself from the conflict of, in prayer, the battle in prayer, it's just sensible. I'm going back to this. Lord, I want your spirit to have his way in that life, in that church, in our nation, among those that lead us, uh, in opposition to wickedness. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. The importance of the spirit. And... Um, the natural thing is, they said, we, we, we're, we are in the flesh, we're walking through this earth for our 70, 80, year, whatever years it is. 
if we're called of God, if we're serving God, we have a time in the which we want to do his will and we purpose to do his will and we discover what that is and we, we lay hold of the means that he's given us, which are mainly prayer, obedience, his promises, putting ourselves in the right place with the right people. But the key is warfare in the spirit. And, what, and what's the, I'm still on my thought about the battle for the mind how we think, to verse 5 then of 1, 2 Corinthians 10, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, that's the system of correcting thinking. That's the system. Spiritual warfare against that which isn't true, but which is so clever, so pervasive, so determinedly put forward by wicked beings. And we know that we get the, um, uh, you know, the, the, we are, our warfare again is not against flesh and blood, but it's against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And you think about it, friends, we are... We're in a place where there's a terrific conflict, there's a battle going on over the human race. That's what it's about. The souls of men. Souls. And um, they are a very precise, calculated attack on human thinking. What's the goal of these terrible spirits in high places? I'm not exaggerating when I say that. We'll pick it up maybe from Ephesians in a minute. But what's the goal? To banish the light of Christ from this world, from every soul. That is the goal. That's the, that is the real issue. That we're, that's the real battle. That's the fight. That's the warfare in the which we are to conduct ourselves with spiritual weaponry. That's their plan. And aren't they good at what they do? Look at the way people think. And I mean that shocking verse in Revelation 12, verse 9, the devil has deceived the whole world. And mainly in relation to Jesus Christ. Mainly there. Because he knows that they will be rescued from his clutches, they'll be transformed from fallen souls that can't think straight to children of God who can see through him, who can defeat him, can overcome him. That's where the battle is. It's in the mind. It's in faith. And um, what defeats spiritual darkness? Truth. Truth. I'm trying to say a lot of things quickly, and I hope I'm not giving you indigestion. But, and, and isn't that where this fight began, in the garden? You know, he, he says to Eve, has God said that? I'm challenging truth. He didn't say that. That's what he's doing. I'm challenging truth. And that will destroy your soul if I succeed with that challenge against what, what God has said. This is the reality of what we're up against, friends. It's the truth of the battle that we're in. It's a huge battle. And um, truth defeats darkness. It defeats what these beings are up to. I'll just pick that up because uh, I don't want to say things that um, you know, I can't always substantiate, but I wasn't planning to do this, but um, <coughs> sorry, verse, I'm sorry, in six, Ephesians 6, 12, uh, page 1183, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We aren't fighting people. Now, a lot of people are very wicked. They are used by Lucifer to do very wicked things. And we're not fighting them. I mean, if you, if, if you, know, if you make it now, Jesus said, if, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight. You wouldn't be arresting me. They'd have their swords out. And you get some of these incredibly dangerous men in this world. You could name some. I could name one right now that was flagged up this morning by... Elon Musk flagged him up, you know, where well, he should put a bullet in his head. He wouldn't be doing anything else, would he? But the power that is using him would laugh at you if you thought that was the way. Would laugh at you. 
we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places who are determined to banish the light of Christ from human souls. That's their objective. And the only people that can see through them and combat them by spiritual weapons are real Christians. And that's what we are up against. That's what we are to be doing, friends. And we're doing it very determinedly and emphatically. So how do we fight this fight, fight, win this battle? Well, I've written down a few points. The first thing, remember, they are in rebellion against God. They are very, some very powerful angels who are in rebellion against God. They will not obey him. They decided that maybe they could win this fight. Mad, ludicrous. But, and then pride corrupted their rationality, actually. What could be more irrational than any being? Say, I'm to fight God and beat God. Are you mad? Yes. But, but still incredibly clever, thoughtful, brilliant, and subversive, even though you're mad. Dangerous. And um, so if that's their thing, fighting against God, our thing is obeying God. That's our chief thing in this battle. Whatever it costs me, whatever it takes, I'm going to do what God has said. I'm his subject, he's my Lord, and that's my fulfilment in this world. In time and eternity, that's my fulfilment. I'm his creature to do with me as he pleases. And I'm happy with that, and all I want is for that to be fulfilled totally in my earthly existence. And I, will, I am going to be obedient to God. The first thing to win this battle. And then scripture. Truth. Because it's, it's always a battle against truth, isn't it? I was trying to, trying to not to go directly against it. They're too clever to do that. But just a little twist. So much damage to the church has been done just like that. Just, just twist, a little, twist it a little bit. And then in comes a flood of change to thinking, to the way people think. Obedience, scripture, prayer, prayer, prayer. Pray, pray, pray. I was reading, um, I think it was Oswald Chambers. You know, I'm not, my memory's not what it was, but, uh, and I can't, don't think I can exactly quote it, but paraphrasing it, don't pray about doing the greater work Prayer is the greater work. Absolutely. You know, the, the things that God has done in response to prayer would astonish us, friends. Would astonish us. The souls that have been saved because they've been those who've got down on their knees and taken hold of God. And, and like Jacob at Peniel, I've had that spirit. I'm not letting go until you bless me. I can't go away without God's intervention in this matter. I'm praying until it happens. You know, that's why I, think, I believe that in many ways those terrible powers have terrified of us, you know. I, um, believe me, I respect them immensely. You'll never get me yelling at them, binding them, belittling them, mocking them. You'll never, never, never. But God gives us the victory over them. He's got nothing, Lucifer's got nothing that can beat the blood of Jesus. Nothing. And um, with great humility and carefulness, understanding what we're up against, we can win by praying and believing in Christ and his atoning death and his power over all things. I, I have all power in heaven and on earth. This we're on earth. Aren't we? This is where this conflict is going on. It's in the heavenly realm, but it's acted out among men. And that's where we are engaged. And, um, and then you've got those, we go there often enough, but just to um, remind us of those three ingredients, those three parts of our weaponry. The blood of Jesus Christ, chief thing, I think, 
that, um, as I say, it defeats everything the devil's got against me. I, I, I deserve nothing but the wrath of God, actually. I, I, I'm not saying that to sound humble or pious. It's an absolute truth. What do you deserve? I deserve to be destroyed because I'm a sinner. And I've got a record of wickedness that is appalling. And I don't even, nobody does, I don't even understand how appalling sin is. Every act of sin is a warfare against God, a holy God. Every one of them. At the highest level or the worst level, the lowest levels. And um, to think that I am able to go into the unseen world, a human soul, as if I had never sinned. How? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. What a weapon. And then the word of our testimony, and I hope you've got a testimony, that you can really look back and say, this was where God met with me. And I say it often enough, but like the man born blind, they couldn't, he couldn't argue with those professors from Gamaliel's school. But he says, I'll tell you one thing, you cannot take from me, I used to be blind, now I see. You can't take it from me, friends. I mean, there are lots of people who could out-argue with, with me on any lots of points. But that, you cannot take that from me. And if you've met with God and you know that there was a time when he opened your blind eyes and liberated you from your guilt, washed your soul free from guilt in his precious blood, you know it's happened. It's not something you wish had happened. You know it's happened. It's a weapon. And then loving not their lives unto the death. I've got to just say this about testimony. You, you might say, well, I don't really have that kind of powerful testimony. Don't worry about it, friends. You can gain that from the Lord, but you can even see what God has done with other lives to know the power of testimony. That, um, that, that way that person who was so awful has become so wonderful, who is so in the dark, is full of light and truth, who didn't even pray, but now... His prayers are answered. You see it happening. You know, there's a, an experience that others have I, all the time, even this morning. I read and read and read about those who knew God, their lives, their battles, the way they won those battles, uh, their resilience, the things they put up with and battled through and the privations, the things that they didn't have. But they had Christ and you can see it. And you can take that as part of your weaponry. This is the reality of God with human beings who are saved. It's a reality. This is part of my weaponry. And they love not their lives unto the death. That, um, did, and it's a matter of, part of obedience, isn't it? I'm willing to let God do what he wants in me. Whatever it may entail, I've come to a decision. I've made, a, I've made my decision. Made my decision. I'm his to command as he will. To see, I'm talking about souls, delivered from sin. Delivered from sin. And can I say this? Sin is the action of your soul. Your soul. If you're taking something that you shouldn't, it's not your hand, it's you. You're watching porn. It's not your eyes. It's you. And you could gouge them out and still have filthy dreams and filthy fantasies, couldn't you? It's you. And the soul has got to be delivered from those things that are so ruinous. And um, don't worry, sister. It's okay. Don't worry. And I'm going to mark nine to pick this up. The need for that surgery that surgery I'm at the end of Mark 9 I'm reading from verse 43 if your hand offends you cut it off it's better for you to enter into life maimed 
and having two hands to go into hell to the fire that never should be quenched, where their worm doesn't die and the fire isn't quenched. If your foot offends you, cut it off. Better to enter into life halt, crippled, disabled, and having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never should be quenched, where the worm doesn't die. That's the personality. It never comes to an end. And the fire isn't quenched. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Better enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm doesn't die and the fire isn't quenched. Everyone should be sorted with fire. Every sacrifice should be sorted with salt. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its savour, where will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, have peace one with another. It's important too in this, in this battle when we are united and at peace with each other. It's another very big issue, isn't it? It's why the devil divides churches. He's done it here. And you see, it's essential. If you've got a united force, you that love and believe in God and love each other and have one thing in mind and one purpose in life, they're kind of unstoppable, aren't they? They're invincible. They've got these ingredients, blood of Jesus, real testimonies, They've given up their rights, all their rights. I've got no rights. Do what you like with me, Lord. They're invincible in this terrific battle over the soul. Now, can I just go to this real vital point? I'm coming to a conclusion, but the, the atonement of Jesus Christ gives full salvation. And I was very, I'm in. Um, um, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. Very well-known verse, but it's got everything. 1 Corinthians 1. And on page um, 1149. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We could spend all day looking at those four things which we have in the Son of God. Wisdom. Well, the fear of the Lord is where wisdom starts. Righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. It's the righteousness of, of the sinless life. The life that never sinned, that was full of faith and love and truth and defeated death because there was no guilt that could hold him down there. And I need to have that life. It's the only kind of life that can ever take me to heaven. I can't possibly have it by anything I could do in a million years. But that righteousness is of Christ. He has made to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, holiness. I am set apart from this world and I, and I have finished with this world. I've made a decision about the world. And I've taken Christ for my holiness as well as my redeemer. Redemption. He's paid the debt. It's been paid. And um, to think what Adam lost. But you know, we have got something more than Adam lost. I mean, Adam was perfect, made in the image of God, but capable of being tempted and obviously capable of falling. But when we've been, when we've been through the real Christian experience, I use that word real, real Christian experience something has happened in redemption I've been where sin is I've been set free from that and, and as I'm faithful to Christ it cannot touch me but I have an understanding and the devil said you'll get an understanding they did get an understanding they died for it but they got an understanding didn't they but I have an understanding of right and wrong, from experience, I have an understanding of redemption from that which destroys. And I'm safe in Christ forever through the real Christian experience. And I'm completely new. My last thought, David, thank you. I'm in um, 2 Corinthians 5. Don't, don't worry, sister, don't, we're never finishing. doesn't matter. 2 Corinthians 5. Can I turn these pages? 
you probably know where I'm going. What it is for a soul that's been redeemed. In verse 17. Uh, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Built, all things are become new. A soul truly redeemed. Thank you.